We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Global Alliance for a Values-Based Digital World session organized by the Kosciuszko Institute. My name is Maciej Gura. I'm a project coordinator at the Institute, and I will have the pleasure of being your host for the panel. The Kosciuszko Institute and CyberSec Forum have been supporting processes contributing to a safe, inclusive, and fair, fair cyberspace for many years through a multitude of initiatives. This time, taking advantage of the IGF 2021 we have decided to formally initiate here our another project, the Declaration of Values for a Human-Centric Digital World. In order to kick off this initiative, we have invited here today many excellent scholars and researchers, representing leading think tanks and academic institutions from all around the world, who kindly agreed to share their vision on the importance of values and ethics in cyberspace, and the threats that lie ahead of us. It is a great honor to welcome you here and for welcome and thank you for joining our panel. Thanks to advances in technology and the internet, humanity is able to create solutions and inventions that most people could only dream of a few decades ago. We have developed languages through which we talk to the computers and they change the world at our will. We have created types of code that learn and reason by themselves. We have allowed machines to make decisions about our movements, health, and relationships. We have invented technologies that can transfer more data in a fraction of a second than our ancestors processed in a lifetime. However, we are also becoming increasingly aware of the threat that technology poses to our daily lives. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic highlighted some of the issues that have been haunting us for a while now. The erosion of democracy, the loss of privacy, the growing numbers of cyber attacks jeopardizing the very functioning of our countries and economies, and the danger to the fabric of societies posed by unsustainable digitalization. As cybersecurity stays on the agenda of all policymakers around the world, it is also important to take a step back and examine how new technologies change our reality, especially as it seems that before we were able to regulate the cyberspace, it is already changing with the rapid digital transformation and evolution of social media. As think tanks, we are committed to actively participate in shaping political and social landscapes through our advice, expertise, and research. Through this global alliance of like-minded entities, we want to advocate for a values-based digital world. Our goal is to use our voices, not only to highlight that indeed, we should strive for a digital environment that respects human rights and ethical principles, but also to offer tangible steps and recommendations that other entities should follow as well. In order to achieve that, we look at trends and technologies that we anticipate will shape the digital future in the next decade and analyze them through prism of values we believe should guide us onwards. The result will be a declaration of think tanks intended to serve as a guideline for public-private partnerships that will create our future. The declaration will be officially signed during CyberSec Global 2022, happening on January 25th, and will be updated each year to continually map the opportunities and threats we face. And without further ado, I would like now to give voice to our esteemed panelists, starting with Professor Ibo van de Paul, professor in ethics and technology at Delft University of Technology, 
whose work laid foundation for our research on the topic. Professor, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, for this nice uh, uh, introduction. I hope everybody can hear me properly. Uh, yeah, I, I see people nodding. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Uh, and and I must say I was honored to see that you used uh, uh, my work as an inspiration for 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 drafting uh, 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 your declaration. I was myself not involved in, in, in drafting the declaration. I should maybe say that, but but I saw uh, you used some of my work, and I found that uh, really nice to see. Also, as an academic, that my work work does not only have some academic value, but maybe uh, broader can serve as an inspiration for such declarations. Uh, as an introduction, I, I I want to say a few things. So, so first of all, I. I I want to say a bit uh, about why I think these values and why we need this value-based value, uh, value -based, uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, and I think one thing why it is interesting to, to focus on, on, on values, because values give us normative guidance. They help us to orient to things that we find normatively important, uh, but they're also relatively open-ended. Uh, 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 values are often shared by people from, from different backgrounds, by different cultures, uh, people with an engineering background, with a social science background. So I think values have this uh, ability to, to uh, unite people. Um, that can also mean that it's sometimes a, a, a bit fake or, or, or and, and need to be translated in, in action. And I was happy to see that uh, the declaration also tries to make that translation in what it actually can mean and what actually means in actions. I think values are also attractive because they uh, combine uh, or have the ability to, to guide actions uh, in different domains. And, and I wrote down a number of things in, in which I think are very important in this, in this uh, uh, value-based uh, uh, digital uh, world. So uh, values can guide technological developments. Uh, there's a lot of work in, in, in my field. I'm an ethicist of technology, a lot of work on what we call uh, value-sensitive value design or design for values, or you know this notion also of privacy by design, but there's a lot of work how we can use values to guide technological development. I think, secondly, values can be guiding in the use of technologies. I was also very happy to see that the document mentioned uh, digital literacy, uh, but I would like to stress that digital literacy not only means uh, knowing the technologies, but it also means uh, knowing a little bit what the values are we want these technology to use for. So I think digital literacy also has this value uh, 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 component. Uh, then values can be Im important for, for governments, for, for regulation, for governance. And, and, and there's also in the document a lot how we, we might translate values in, 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 into uh, 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 governance frameworks. And, and finally, but certainly last but not least, Values are important in, in the corporate world uh, and, and for companies. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about corporate social responsibility, uh, also value-based. And I think this translation is also important and also to make sure that this is not, not just talk or words, but you really mean something for what these companies uh, do. But I think these values have this, this ability to combine all these, these sectors. So uh, I don't know, yeah, I, I can take maybe still one minute. Uh, in the, in, uh, in the document, uh, uh, it's based, uh, use of publications for me about uh, values in, in cybersecurity, mentioning these four values clusters, uh, security, uh, privacy, fairness, and accountability. Uh, I want to stress two things about these values clusters. One, these clusters are meant as broad clusters. So privacy is not just about privacy uh, as, an, as, a, as one value, but it relates to values like autonomy, dignity, identity. So this would be really seen as, as value clusters. And another thing I was thinking, because when I wrote this, my work was mainly focused on cybersecurity, the kind of merger of technologies we're now talking about with IoT, blockchain, uh, virtual reality, I think some other values, and one particular value that might import it is how this affects the life of the daily life and, and, and also the intimate life of people. These technologies are coming much closer to us. So I was thinking a value like, for example, uh, well-being, uh, uh, what it means for humans, uh, how it changes their identity. I think these values are also really important uh, uh, to take in, into consideration because these technologies are going to have on our uh, personal and daily and even uh, our friendships, they're going to also have a big uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you, Professor van der Poel. And now I would like to ask Juan Manuel Aguilar Antonio, cybersecurity 
cybersecurity investigator at the Collective of Security Analysis with Democracy AC in Mexico City to share his opinion with us. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, at first, I want to uh, thank to stay here in this panel with a lot of these researchers and scholars uh, related to cybersecurity issues. I want to thank to the Kosciuszko Institute at with the Internet Governance Forum, and it will be an honor to be a part of this discussion. I focus uh, my uh, speech related to the development of cyber capabilities in Latin America region and the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic in uh, all countries. Uh, in a few weeks in Latin America, uh, countries millions of children and adults needs to migrate to their home and use technologies in all of the aspects of his lives to continue with his activities. In this context, uh, a lot of governments, private business, school institutions weren't ready to these challenges. The consequences are present today. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that the Latin America students are two years behind in their training compared to the rest of the world. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean expressed that the gross domestic product of the countries of the regions fall between 15 and 22%. And finally, institutions like Statista and ICET Crime present that cyber crimes grew 18% from the figures from the 2019. In this way, the discussion about cluster value related to the issue of the ethics of cybersecurity had an important significance today in the world and this meeting. Security, privacy, fairness, and accountability represent the main goals to achieve a secure cyber space in the next years in the frame of the rise of new global technologies like 5G and 6G, machine learning and artificial intelligence, distributed ledger technologies or quantum computing. In recent years, uh, I focus my personal research in the topic of the development of cyber capabilities and the building of national cyber security strategies in Mexico and Latin America countries. Uh, these tasks are based in the framework of global references like global cybersecurity agenda, of the International Telecommunication Unions, the National Cybersecurity Index of the E-Governance Academic of Estonia, and the National Cybersecurity Framework Manual by the authorship of the, of the Professor Krimburg and publisher of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn. Uh, in other hands, reports like Cybersecurity Are We Ready in Latin America and the Caribbean of 2016, and the 22 uh, cybersecurity report developed by the Inter-America Bank and the Organization of America States give us an outlook of the point where the region is located. Uh, in my paper, the cybersecurity gap in Latin America against the global context of cyber threats, uh, published the last year in the Journal of International Security Studies of the University of Granada in Spain, I found that Latin America is behind in a percentage of 25 to 40% in the development of cyber capabilities compared to the nations, uh, to the NATO nations and Europe. In this context, uh, the challenges of Latin America are stronger than other regions in the world because an important part of the countries of the region are not building yet a national cyber security strategy to attend the global cyber risk. The necessary policies to prepare the telecommunication infrastructure to each country to receive benefits of the new technologies like 5G or 6G, quantum computing of distributed ledger technologies are not ready. In addition, Latin America, it will suffer an important lag of the benefits of these new technologies in the next years. Uh, in this context, uh, Latin America, it will be a protagonist of the debates of the agenda towards values based on the digital world to reduce this gap between the region and the rest of the world. That's all of my part, Masset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Manuel, for this insight. And I would now like to ask Professor Alina Burgawano, fellow at Harvard University and senior associate expert of New Strategy Center to take the floor. Professor, if you will. Hello, everybody. Again, thank you for this invitation. I am extremely honored to be in such prestigious uh, companionship. And also I'm extremely honored to take part of this conversation that is more timely than ever. My background uh, is in disinformation. This is the topic that I have been studying systematically for the last uh, four years. 
So out of the very inspired background presentation that was done at the beginning of our panel, I will talk about the threats uh, that uh, the internet technologies entail. Uh, so my understanding of uh, this information is that it represents a threat to democracy. It represents a threat to privacy. But I think more importantly, it, re it represents a threat to the capacity of societies to function, irrespective of their political model in the end. So this is why I'm paying so much attention to it, because again, the, the big effect of these information campaigns is to alter our perception of reality, to live in two different worlds, to create an all or nothing type of polarization, and again, to create the, the, the type of political fragmentation that makes societies really unable to function. So this will be my first point that the threat of disinformation is probably much bigger than we can think. Again, it can render societies impossible to function. The second point that I would like to make in this uh, context is that disinformation is a new phenomenon. This is why I think that my work uh, fits, uh, fits directly into our conversation about internet governance, because uh, my arguments in favor of the idea that we are dealing with a new phenomenon are the following. This information takes place under conditions of information overabundance and not information scarcity, which is completely different from what has happened until the explosion of the internet and of social media. The second one is that contemporary disinformation is, the, it is, the, is technology driven. So it is again co-substantial with internet and social media. Technology offer possibilities to go straight to the people. And also it provides technological possibilities for people to spread it even being unaware of it. This is why sometimes contemporary propaganda, it is called empriganda, Bottom, bottom up propaganda, crowdsource propaganda, or peer to peer propaganda, which again is completely different from other forms of traditional propaganda that we are familiar with. Uh, the third point is that, uh, again, in favor of the idea that contemporary disinformation is a new phenomenon because it doesn't alter the distinction between what is real and what is unreal. In other terms, it is not only uh, an information manipulation, but very, very, very important to our discussion today is that it is an engagement manipulation. So contemporary pro propaganda is a fraud with reality, but also it is a fraud with the social component of social media. So it is a fraud with the engagement that can be generated in the internet environment by bots, trolls, clickbait factories, fake followers, and stuff like that. Again, which is completely different. So it is a phenomenon which is an information manipulation and engagement manipulation at the same time. So it is platform driven, it is big data driven, in, and it is increasingly driven by deep fake machine learning and artificial intelligence. I would like to, to conclude my, uh, my very brief uh, contribution with the idea that any action towards internet governance uh, should be, as you well, very well understood, uh, underlined, human centric. In other words, my opinion is that internet governance regulations, measures, or policies should be taken, taking care that fundamental freedoms are preserved, that freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, freedom of the press are preserved, but with the caveat that this kind of freedom should be applied to humans and not to bots, to computer accounts, to technologies that can fake image, audio, or writing. So again, my pledge is to have a human-centric digital world in which fundamental freedoms are included, but again, underlying strong enough that these freedoms should be applied to persons should be applied to humans and probably more precisely should be applied to citizens and not to uh, technological possibilities to come up with fake engagement such as again trolls, bots, um, fake followers, clickbait factories and other technological driven possibilities. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this honor to present these things in front of you. Thank you, Professor Borgenau. That was a great insight. 
Now I would like to switch attention to Dr. Pashko Bleach, Senior Research Associate at Institute for Development and International Relations. Dr. Bleach, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the tentative title of, of my brief talk is uh, Reconsidering Public Values in a Data-Driven World. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers from the Institute Kosciuszko for inviting me to participate in this panel within the scope of, uh, Internet, of the Internet Governance Forum. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this group. In my talk, I want to emphasize three different points. First, to explain what I mean by values and public values more specifically. Second, to explain why the critique of technical design is important when talking about a values-based digital world. And third, to emphasize the need to incorporate existing and also create new values in the digital realm. So let me start with a brief overview of what value means from an economic, sociological, and regulatory perspective. From an economic perspective, how goods and services are produced, how they are shared across the economy, and what is done with the earnings that are created from their production are key questions in defining economic value. Another crucial aspect is whether the production output is actually useful to society. It can be profitable, but if it produces too many negative externalities, such as pollution or distribution of disinformation, it may not be useful to society. So value is often equated with any activity that has a price. Earning profits and rents becomes the main drive for expanding what is valuable. From a sociological perspective, values represent beliefs and ideals which form the basis for choices and preferences at an individual and collective level. Value is usually defined as that which is good and desired. It is not yet a legal norm, but is mostly informal and present in cultures, behaviors, customs, and traditions. From a regulation perspective, both economic and sociological value are enshrined in normative principles from market competition to freedom of speech and cultural diversity. These normative principles are agreed upon in the international community and the rule of law. Yet once agreed upon, how are they enacted in practice? Consider freedom of expression. It is often trapped in dualism between freedom to express something and freedom from certain actors. This is by no means an easy dualism as freedom to express certain things often requires a debate on the boundaries of such freedoms. Freedom from certain actors can be freedom from the interference of the state and freedom from the interference of private actors. This is where we arrive at what I will call public values. In the last 30 years, digital technologies were largely developed by private actors with the majority of states taking a laissez-faire approach to regulation. This has begun to change. Without public values, the decisions on what is beneficial to society are left to technical design and code in line with the need for expanding profits by private actors beyond democratic governance. And this is my second point. This is why we need the critique of technical design when talking about a values-based digital world. Digital technology is neither neutral nor deterministic. It is created with a certain purpose for the social world. Unlike with media regulation, the point where a new normative social contract is needed is technology itself moldable between the needs and interests of its owners and the experience of its users. Yet this relationship is by no means symmetrical. The actors in power are those who have different pressures towards realizing their earnings through technical design. So what should we do about it? And this is my third and final point. We need more freedom from technology shaped only by profit considerations. Societies should demand a new social contract. In the context of media regulation, traditional mechanisms were ensured through ownership concentration restrictions, support to public service, nonprofit and community media, quotas for producing socially inclusive and plural media content and so on. While most tech companies are not media in a traditional sense, their technologies have similar effects on society and the public debate. Therefore, we need to insist on promoting not just negative sanctions to control negative externalities of their technologies, but also positive obligations with some blueprints already existing in media regulation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bleach. Our next speaker will be Ms. Laura Brandt, Senior Fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Ms. Brandt, please share your thoughts with us. 
Good morning. I would uh, join the rest of the panelists in saying thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate the work done to produce this document and this event and thinking about some of today's most worrying trends, disinformation, erosion of privacy, accelerated digital transformation and cybercrime across a consistent set of values is I think a useful and interesting approach. You know, perhaps bearing this in mind, I would really offer four questions for us to consider when we think about really our ability to address these trends. Is first, how do we assemble the right people? These are all fundamentally cross-disciplinary issues, which sometimes make it hard to get the right expertise together. Thinking about what we heard about disinformation already this morning, you need to bring together technologists, policy people, ethicists, sociologists, perhaps journalists, you know, so on and so forth. So as we really call for change across these things, especially in a values-based way, I think it's important to consider what expertise we need. Second, I would say, how long do we think do we really have to affect meaningful change? Government, government change is fundamentally generally pretty slow, which is usually appropriate as hasty rules can be hard to undo. But with many technology issues, I would say it already feels that we are far behind where we should be in terms of regulation, whether that's social media or thinking particularly in the US, really around even basic privacy protections. With the pace of technological change seeming only likely to increase, how do we change our approaches? What issues do we need to start thinking about now that perhaps have not even arrived? I mean, one of the things that I feel like we're starting to talk about is the metaverse. You know, what is the metaverse? I think we can't exactly say at this point, but how do we start thinking about the way we will continue to interact with technology more closely in the very near future? Third, I would ask us all to think about also what does success look like when we're thinking about a more values based world for some of these technology trends. You know, getting to zero online harms is, I think, sadly, not necessarily a very likely goal. So what are really the qualitative and quantitative measures that we can think about what success looks like, what progress looks like? I think it's very easy to focus on some of the negatives of technology and in these conversations. So I think framing a discussion around what good outcomes might look like is useful. And then finally, something I would say that I you know, think about quite a bit is, do we think this change will be gradual or discontinuous? That the pace of technological change fundamentally still seems greater than the pace of governmental or even technology sector change, you know, the sector as a whole changing the way it approaches some of these issues. So this would mean that fundamentally the ability of governments to influ influence technologies will go down over time if we are seeking incremental change. But if we think change will be discontinuous, what do you actually think will force us to rethink some of our approaches fundamentally? Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Brent. Uh, those were so, some really valid questions. Uh, now I ask doc Dr. Joe Burton, Senior Lecturer in the Political Science and the Public Policy Program and the New Zealand Institute for Security and Crime Science, University of Waikato, to share his observation with us. Well, thank you very much. And uh, similar to, to the other guests, it's a really a great honor to be here today. Thank you for the inv invitation. Uh, I want to speak on um, the problem of upholding human-centric values in cyberspace and I think in its early years, the internet was often referred to as a platform to create trust and transparency, uh, to hold governments to account and ultimately contribute to a more uh, peaceful world. And unfortunately, uh, over the last decades, in my own view, at least, I think the opposite is happening. Uh, the internet is becoming securitized, weaponized and militarized. Uh, in many countries, including all the great powers, uh, military intelligence agencies have acquired a prominent role in cybersecurity, and offense is widely seen as providing the best uh, defense in cyberspace, despite very credible arguments to the contrary. Uh, this national military and intelligence led agency approach to cybersecurity has been widespread and has had several ne negative consequences for dealing with cybersecurity uh, threats, including creating path dependencies in which tensions between the private sector and governments have continued. Uh, where overclassification of cyber threats has occurred, and actually where the broader societal impacts of malicious use of the Internet are, are only beginning to be uh, better understood and identified. 
So the question in my view becomes, well, what do we need to do to change direction? How can we create a more people-centered approach uh, that respects human rights and uh, values that others have talked about? Uh, firstly, I think we need to recognize that people don't operate in isolation. We are social beings and we need cyber policy that's focused not on protecting national security states, but on protecting societies. And in this respect, I think society should be the referent object of cyber security. Uh, second, I think we need to rearticulate the current narratives that dominate uh, the field. Uh, language matters, but too often we hear the internet depicted as something that needs to be controlled. We hear the discourse around digital Pearl Harbor, cyber 9-11s, weapons of mass disruption, cyber blockades. Uh, this language contributes to an environment of fear in which policy is made and serves the interests of actors who want to compete for funding or acquire new power. A better focus for our discourse would be on healthy cyber ecosystems, online safety, and actually on the sustainability of our networks as platforms for trust and, again, our values. Uh, this rearticulation of cyber conflict uh, constitutes a first step towards a broader desecuritization process where military and intelligence agencies stay in their lane, uh, where we avoid overreach by national security agencies, where we avoid creating cybersecurity dilemmas, i.e. patterns of activity that create fear and mistrust in cyberspace, where we treat cybercrime as cybercrime and not as a military threat that needs military solutions. And we actually involve societal actors, civil society, educational institutes, healthcare, more proactively in decision and policy making in cybersecurity. Fourth and finally, I think we need to move beyond a negative piece in cyberspace or the idea of one based on stability and norms to a more positive piece. Uh, the attachment to norms and the application of international law has been commendable and necessary, but norms and stability only constitute a negative form of cyberspace in which structural cyber violence will still exist and in, in which states will have incentives to cheat and abrogate their commitments. Positive peace in cyberspace will be based on human and societal centric approaches that I've mentioned already. We'll seek to break the perpetual cycle of cyber violence in which states are constantly preparing for cyber war and cyber conflict, and will ultimately deal also with the still vast digital inequalities that exist today, and which I would argue at the heart of much of cyber conflict. This path will, of course, not be an easy one. It will be confronted by powerful interests, but ultimately, I would argue, is a necessary way forward if we're to avoid constructing the same vulnerabilities and pathologies that have emerged in this space in recent years. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Many thanks, Dr. Burton, for this intervention. Now I would like to switch over to Dr. Oscar G. Gustrain, Assistant Professor at the University of Groningen and Research Associate at Israel Public Policy Institute. Doctor, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on this panel and apologies for the name on the screen. I had some trouble logging in, so uh, thankfully the colleagues from the Institute think, uh, helped me out and I would like to thank you uh, once again for inviting me and it's really a big pleasure and honor to be on this panel with the esteemed colleagues. And I think we already heard a lot of interesting things what I'm going to do in my intervention is uh, giving a couple of reflections uh, regarding the, the draft paper that has been put out, but with a particular focus uh, towards privacy. But uh, before I go into that, what really struck uh, me from the start were those lines at the very beginning in the very first paragraph where it says, we have developed languages through which we talk to computers and they change the world at our will we have created types of code that learn and reason by themselves. And what I find particularly interesting is that there is a lot of um, language there that, that describes this relationship between humans and uh, computers and machines. But at the same time, I think what we are seeing more and more is that there is a gap in uh, work and effort uh, to make sure that we as humans and as different groups of disciplines and different cultural types of backgrounds have a similar or at least compatible language when looking into this, right? And I think this has already been raised uh, by a couple of colleagues in their interventions. But for my background, I think it is particularly important here to point out that there is actually quite a lot of uh, regulation 
and uh, governance mechanisms there, uh, which are actually uh, approaching this from a multilateral perspective. And instead, what we're seeing mostly on the political level, also when we uh, look at this from a, from a European perspective, for instance, from the GDPR perspective and general data protection regulation perspective, we have blocks like the European Union or other powerful players really looking at this from a very power-based kind of approach. So this is one of the themes that I um, I looked in my research recently so that there is a, a sort of a, a power-based approach in the extraterritoriality, for instance, um, in, the, uh, in the general data protection regulation. And we've argued for that. Uh, although, of course, the general data protection regulation as such would be perceived as a tool uh, which is protecting privacy and which is uh, heightening the standards, which is a positive thing, of course. But at the same time, we have to be careful in how we do this and how we do this with respect to the rest of the world. And just would like to highlight this because again, I think there are multilateral standards available. So for instance, when you look at the work of the Council of Europe that it has done, uh, which would be, um, could be uh, giving a segue into having a much more multilateral type of approach there. But of course, all of this is only possible if there is uh, enough political will there on a, on a global stage, on a cross regional stage to do this. And this is certainly something that we see uh, lacking. Now, uh, when focusing on, on, on privacy specifically, uh, there are a couple of uh, values, I think we could call them, which are mentioned in the document, such as moral autonomy, human dignity, identity, etc. And I think um, the point I would like there to make right from the start is that uh, privacy is a concept that when you look at it historically, is always changing, right? So there's a lot of uh, sociological literature uh, on, on privacy in Aboriginal camps, in uh, Aleppo, uh, uh, in Syria, uh, case law from the 18th century, but also even when you think about this article from Warren Brandeis, which was famous from the Harvard Law Review Journal from 1890, which is often perceived in the West to be the origin of the privacy debate. Also there a technological change was occurring, namely the use of instant photography and also newspaper coverage of a, a wedding of one of the authors, which then eventually led to the um, to the urge of them to reframe the privacy concept and what we perceive as the start of the modern day privacy debate. So in that sense, I think it's actually quite natural that we have this debate with the technology changing, with the economy changing, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot to work with. So when we look at uh, data protection specifically, and this brings me to the next point, then we have a uh, tradition uh, which originated from Europe in the 1970s, where we have over 50 years of principles in how to protect data. But there you see already there is a gap again, and it brings me, you know, that connects to my language point that I made at the beginning, we need a common language. So we're talking about privacy, we're talking about data protection. There are other concepts such as informational self-determination, uh, et cetera, and there are new approaches and all of this seems to go into the same direction and has parallels, but at the same um, time, there are also points of friction. And I think um, uh, this is something that we need to pay much, much more attention to. There is a lot of knowledge and information uh, to work with, and it's also not the problem necessarily that there is a lack in, in governance frameworks, but there is certainly a lack is uh, political will to really work on these issues on a, uh, on a multilateral perspective in order to, and that is what is the end goal, right? What do we want to achieve with this? Uh, to, to increase our uh, autonomy again, because ultimately, of course, that is what privacy is about in the end. It's about this question, balance autonomy of the individual uh, versus, the, um, versus the collective, and how should this power balance be structured? And there recently, uh, we see very, very trends, as you all know, and of course, uh, that we see a, a lack, increasing lack of um, the um, autonomy of the individual uh, for all kinds uh, of reasons, whether that's security, which is also mentioned in the document and other kinds of things. Thank you, Dr. Gustrenda. It was great to hear your perspective on the document. Thank you very much. Now it is my pleasure to present Mr. Arthur Guagua, doctoral research at Utrecht University, and member of United Nations Expert Group on AI and Big Data. Mr. Guagua, please let us know your insights. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, inclusion. Um, how can we create an inclusive shared culture that leaves no one behind? Uh, my interest is mostly on group rise group values, especially in the global south,
because the global south and in particular africa has been left behind in their previous industrial revolutions and with the deployment of artificial intelligence and you know data centric uh, technologies that can be repurposed across sectors like you know do our use technologies that can be used in economic social and political sphere we are seeing that you know the the deployment of those technologies in, in, in the developing world is building upon and ex exacerbating existing inequalities. And most of the regions in, in Africa are being you know, left behind. I think what, what we are seeing is that you know, these technologies are, are converging and we can learn something from this technology. They are converging to work together but the divide between you know, the cultures that have and the cultures that don't have is, is widening. Uh, the reason is that I think the globalized economic system, uh, decisions, economic decisions and social dis decisions are made far away from the people whom you know, the decisions impact. You know, decisions on value chains, on global value chains, on, on, on supply chains resource allocation are being made far away from the people who supply you know those resources like you know the decision about using cobalt you know for example in in, in digital technologies the cobalt comes from the drc uh congo but then it is used in europe so what happens is when production shifts from one place to the other or when decision making is shifted to another continent through algorithms it leaves disgruntled workers in the local economy depending on them in the dark because the decisions are taken too far away from them and the web of causes and justifications for those decisions is often too complex for them to understand or comprehend so we are likely to see a backlash and at the consequences of globalization and, 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 and the, the current you know, digitization, which is not based on the inc inclusive culture and values. And the backlash is most likely to be acute in the global South, when the benefits of the current revolution have not been perceived as being distributed fairly, and when there are insufficient protections uh, who are given to those people who are losing their jobs as a result of the, the current digitization. And then another thing is a balancing innovation and, and, and people's values, people's cultures. Because you know, companies like Facebook and Metaverse, they are built on breaking standards. Info innovation is about breaking standards, breaking values, uh, br breaking, making some quantum leaps. But this is leading to a situation where you know, these global technology companies are operating in environments where they do not really understand the complex cultures in those environments. So they enter into those environments and break standards, values, and make their own rules. And this actually makes you know, people in those societies angry because societal fabric and, 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 and this political fragmentation is one of the earlier speakers in sight. So if, and then we've got Tesla, you know, for example, which comes into an economy and say, let's automate everything. What does it mean in terms of you know, group values? What does it mean in terms of our collective way of lives as human beings? As an earlier speaker said, you know, agency should not be given to machines, to computers. We should still stick to our own values, shared values as human beings. So if we continue blindly forward like this, we should expect to see increased inequality uh, alongside economic disruption social unrest and in some cases political instability with the technologically disadvantaged and underrepresented populations of the world in you know, offering the west so yet we can create a shared shared inclusive culture and transition together into a new world where no culture no creed no people no continent is left behind where we can share the benefits of this industrial revolution thank you Te Technology already gives us the tools and the power to do so. What we need is the willpower and political commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guagua. That was a great insight. Now, please welcome Dr. Alexander Klimburg, 
Director of Cyber Policy and Resilience Program at Hague Center for Strategic Studies. Dr. Klimburg, please share your thoughts with us. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you also to the organizers for the invitation. Like the others, I was intrigued by the approach and the high-level title. Um, unlike others, perhaps I have to admit I only looked at the document uh, a brief while ago. So I wanted to share some thoughts on what I read there in particular, since we don't really have that much time um, for this presentation. First of all, I was struck that the entire document is really about the use of the internet and not really so much about the development of the internet. So the original split of these two terms of responsibilities is really defined in the WISIS 2005 Tunis document. The development of the internet is internet governance. The use of the internet is everything else. This is the Internet Governance Forum. So I would expect one of the macro trends to be addressed is to include increasing pressures on the internet governance ecosystem. And in particular, I would look for a reference on a particular pressure on the multi-stakeholder model of managing internet resources. So this model is under threat from both within and without. Um, without, it's been under threat really since 1998. Um, and there are increasing attempts through the securitization of the internet to move the rationale for managing internet resources away from non-state bodies to state bodies. Uh, this has concentrated in part on efforts in the UN First Committee, where I have spent a lot of my time in the UN Group of Governmental Experts and the Open-Ended Working Group to creating a picture of cyber conflict and in particular societal cyber conflict, such as cyber terrorism, which does not really exist in a practical context, but also internet, uh, internet related content crimes, such as, um, uh, as those foreseen in the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization Code of Conduct and therefore invoke a mandate for governments to step in and effectively take more a more stronger uh, role on the manage managing of uh, the domain name system in particular. So these attempts to effectively move the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance into an intergovernmental model uh, have been ongoing for the last 20 years. Uh, they are likely to come up again in, in the next three, four years as we run up to WISIS plus 20. Um, and I think it'd be good to recognize that this is, if we believe in the IGF mission, this is something that we need to take in, that we need to consider. Second of all, there is also um, pressure on the multi-stakeholder model from inside. The effective proliferation of fora and initiatives has made it very difficult for the technical community and civil society to participate to the same level that it has in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, this is particularly is relevant, for instance, with the development of open standards and standard settings. So everything that we do, DNS, BGP, everything that happens in IETF, that is really done by volunteers. But increasingly, you also have state-owned enterprises who are sending people to these meetings and flooding out um, general participation. It's gone so far that actually some European governments have started approaching um, civil society organizations and technical community groups uh, to encourage them to send delegates to these standard-setting meetings because they are concerned that uh, in the future, a lot of the internet related standards will again only be set by governments rather than having been set by volunteers as they have in the past. Second of all, when I'm talking about the context of the use of the internet as this document currently does, I'd like to see a reference that explicitly emphasizes the threat to the internet as a global public good. Um, that is a general discussion that in particular in Europe has been going on for a while, but there's been a lot of support from the global south in this viewpoint. Um, in the open-ended working group and the, the DGE, so the group of governmental experts documents, there is, for instance, however, a clear reference to state actors as having the responsibility to discourage attacks on the availability and integrity of the global internet overall. And that context is that... Uh, they are basing that recommendation off some of the work that my initiative, which is the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace, put forward over the last couple of years, and that is a norm to protect um, the public core of the internet. The concept of the public core of the internet is effectively one that the basic underlying infrastructure norms and services of internet depend upon um, can be categorized more or less into four groups. That is the uh, routing and forwarding, the naming and numbering, cryptographic means of security and identity, and the physical transmission media. These four categories effectively underpin the global, global internet. And we have seen over the last eight, nine years, repeated attempts by a number of different actors, often states, to use 
the critical internet infrastructures as an effectively support instruments for their own cyber malicious cyber activity. Very often espionage, but sometimes other um, other uh, intentions. And we were quite pleased that in the UN First Committee, uh, our norm was picked up, uh, even though they didn't use the term uh, uh, public core of the internet or basically invoke the global public good uh, concept that we both consider to be important. It did concentrate on the idea of protecting the availability and integrity of the global internet. Thank you. Uh, so thanks Sorry. for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Glimberg. Unfortunately, we are slowly running out of time. I would now like to ask to speak Professor Oslit Kolos, research professor at Peace Research Institute of Oslo and leader of ePolitics Initiative. Professor Kolos, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm very honored to be here. I'm not an expert on, on um, you know, data science. So I'm coming from this as a peace researcher. I'm an anthropologist and I've also studied photography and media studies. Um, so I'm just going to go into the, the details of uh, the draft agenda because I think uh, it's true that the devil is in the details. And uh, <clears throat> the draft agenda um, document is a really good and uh, good uh, document, but um, you know, I think it's also important to be a little bit critical and to sort of pick apart some uh, dilemmas that are in inherent in this uh, document. Uh, although, you know, everything is very um, nicely written. But uh, on the information reliability crisis, I just want to read a couple of sentences from there and then give a comment. And I will do the same for uh, the other categories. So in the information reliability crisis, uh, the document says that we need to focus on raising digital literacy in societies around the world, raising awareness of the dangers that disinformation is posing um, and equipping everyone with the skills necessary to distinguish real information from fab fabricated one. Um, it also says that social media must be held accountable for violation of human rights at their platforms. Now, my comment to, to this is that uh, this, uh, if uh, the social media platforms are to be held accountable, they will also need to be allowed to censor. And, um, and my concern is that this will give them an, a greater power to censor expressions of, uh, that should be free and uh, maybe undermine the democratic debate. Uh, and um, I, I'm also wondering if uh, in the in the section on what to avoid, um, <clears throat> it says uh, under accountability that uh, we, we should avoid leaving social media platforms on their own without independent oversight, um, nor mechanisms that would both incentivize and enforce them to take responsibility. But I'm also concerned about leaving decisions on facts to uh, Wikipedia editors and um, unchecked fact check fact checkers. So I, I'm concerned about the freedom of expression and also the, um, the you know, the idea of, I think it's important to, to talk about uh, genres of truth and how um, are, we, are we expecting, let's say, an artistic expression to be uh, the same uh, genre as a news item? So where do we draw the lines between these different genres? The internet is um, uh, developing its own uh, genres like memes and other types of uh, expression that uh, we can, you know, that are new to that uh, technology. So mm, we need to, re you know, uh, think very carefully about uh, what is information and what is artistic expression and how we, um, you know, regulate, uh, you know, these different expressions. So as for erosion of privacy, we need to, it says, uh, the document says that we need to ensure that uh, proper safeguards are embedded by design. Um, all, to protect uh, personal data by ensuring individuals the right to control their personal information, also granting the right to be forgotten. So um, I think this is a very good, well-written um, section, but I have a comment on this uh, and which is uh, that, um, I'm thinking that maybe there's a threat to the um, 
to the right to uh, be um, uh, to use a, a, a pseudonym because of the know your customer regulations that may might be un, under right mining that right and uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, uh, we should look at the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works and how it protects the right of authors uh, to use a pseudonym. And this, this needs to be uh, um, a consideration, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Collis. Now, please welcome Mr. J. Scott Marcus, Senior Fellow at Bruegel. Mr. Marcus, if you please share your opinion with us. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'd like to respond both to the paper and to many of the opinions that I've heard. Uh, and I'd like to start by noting that Albert Einstein once said that things should be as simple as they can be, but no simpler. I, I have to say that I, I worry a little bit that there's, there seems to me to be a tacit assumption here that we can arrive at a single set of goals. And of course, a question here is, and this was raised, I think, also by Professor Billich in, in the original comments by Dupu, that, that um, you know, this document is normative. It's not just positive. And so the question of how it gets embedded ultimately into policy decisions, into regulation and so on uh, is really important. Is it possible to actually reach a single set of goals? Now, if we're going to be looking for goals, we have to make sure that we start from all of the objectives that we have as a society. These digital platforms, as, as Laura Brent said, they generate a lot of value. And that flows from positive externalities from the platforms themselves. Um, so these are positive characteristics that we don't want to sacrifice in, uh, in anything that we would do. Um, but many of these aspects have both positive and negative elements to them. I think, by the way, that most of us would agree that the kind of laissez-faire treatment that we've had over the past decades uh, has outlived its usefulness. What we're seeing in almost all the world is an increasing focus on policy initiatives. So in any case, the large scale that generates these benefits also has negative impacts. It has impacts on competitive entry. It has impacts on consumer welfare. Basically, that the, uh, the, the large platforms can probably suck too much of the uh, economic surplus out of many of the offerings that they provide. So responses are needed at a policy level. Uh, but competition is, is almost totally missing from the paper. And it's an important one in the related economic gains uh, from that and, and from innovation generally, uh, I, I think aren't adequately treated. Now, the presumption uh, of being able to somehow say what we want in terms of, let's say, topics like, um, like misinformation assumes that we know what it misinformation is. And while I entirely agree with the comments that were made earlier, um, what we've already seen is that this is a really complicated problem. I mean, we recently had a head of, head of state of a very powerful country uh, who considered that fake news was anything that he didn't personally agree with. The question of how we get meaningful judgments on this uh, from individuals who aren't uh, conflicted uh, is, I think, a very fundamental challenge. In terms of global consensus, uh, there are topics where I think global consensus is possible. Uh, I think consensus that includes, for instance, China is more possible than a lot of people realize on some topics, clearly not on all. Um, but um, how we get there is an issue. Uh, we already have many cases uh, where individual national laws diverge. Uh, in Germany, where I live, the sale of Nazi paraphernalia is illegal. In most other countries, it's in bad taste, but not illegal. Um, in Europe, we have decades of working to try to strengthen cross-border trade, cross-border flows of goods, services, and, uh, and also information and ideas. Um, but we see that the ability to actually make that work is strongly conditioned on national history, regional history, uh, culture, uh, and uh, that these factors play an inevitable role that can't be ignored, even as much as we'd like to achieve uh, a degree of what in Europe we call harmonization, not uniformity. Now, when we come to the question of how to impose rules, you know, if we were going to get to rules, and here we're talking more about values, but the question of how they get embedded into rules is important. Uh, again, there's a lot of different ways to do this, some of which are a lot more, uh, more practical, I think, than others. One of the things that I like in a recent U European legislative proposal, the Digital Services Act, is that they effectively implement a co-regulatory view. And by the way, Japan is also moving to a co-regulatory view for, uh, for digital platforms. The idea being that the platform identifies itself what it sees as potential threats 
to fundamental freedoms, proposes itself what mitigation measures should be undertaken, and then reports periodically on, on how those are working, but with oversight from a governmental body. And this may in many cases be much more practical than trying to define a set of rules from on high on an extremely diverse palette of digital services. So again, I think the how will matter. Thank you, I'm, I'm happy to close with that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Marcus. And finally, last but not least, I would like to give floor to Dr. Daniel Wilson, Head of Global Issues Research Division at German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Dr. Wilson, please let us know your insights. Thank you and hello everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, it's been great already. I, I learned a lot. Uh, it's been a lot of input and I will try to keep it short, uh, but still contribute uh, to two lines of thoughts. The first is on values, uh, and the draft document lists four what's called value clusters, security, privacy, fairness, and accountability. And I wanna suggest expanding on the last point, or maybe just being more explicit here. It seems important to me to talk about digital democracy, not just accountability. In the early years of the internet, great hopes were, were attached to the internet. It was, was thought to be the foundation for a new wave of democratic, democratization. Yeah. Today, unfortunately, we know that things are a bit more complicated. I think we therefore need a discussion about how to design technologies and the underlying standards in a way that is at least compatible with democratic processes. And ideally, I'd say technology should actually positively support democracy. Also, we need a discussion about certain political concepts. There's a lot of talk now about digital sovereignty. It's an ambivalent, contested concept. And if we want to use it, I want to suggest to understand sovereignty the way it has been understood in the French Revolution as popular sovereignty, or simply, again, democracy. That's my first point. Let's talk more about digital democracy uh, when we're talking about a values-based approach to internet governance. The second then is on institutions, and it kind of uh, picks up on, on where Alexander Klimburg uh, left his comment. From the late 1990s on, the hope was that the internet and related technologies could be governed in a new way. The ideal here was uh, voluntary and inclusive cooperation of all relevant stakeholders. And in fact, the IGF is one of the main embodiments of the ideal of multi-stakeholder governance. Yet we know that more and more states seek to reassert their authority in the domain of communications networks and digital technologies more broadly. Also in recent years in particular, we've witnessed a growing geopolitical, geopolitical confrontation between the US and China, which heavily affects also the field of technology policy. So in, in this larger political context, I think it's not enough to express loyalty to the ideal of multi-stakeholder governance. What we need is an honest debate about how to further develop this ideal, about how multi-stakeholder governance institutions can continue their important work in an ever more politicized context. And maybe we also need a frank discussion about the limits of this kind of uh, governance. And I say that as someone who, who deep heartedly uh, supports the ideal. I want to close here for now, and I hope that we will be We'll have a chance at some other point in the future to continue what has been a very rich and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Volson. So we are over time. So I just want to close by thanking all of our esteemed panelists. It was really great to hear your perspectives, points, critiques uh, regarding the working document. Uh, we as Kosciuszko Institute will be sure to follow those recommendations presented and the uh, work on the document will continue. And if you would like to join us on this journey and support actions towards values-based digital world, please make sure to attend CyberSec Global 2022 happening on January 25th, where we will be also joined by many incredible attendees who will discuss steps to create a safer digital future. Thank you very much.